come to celebrate Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Glory to God. Let's put our hands together. Responses, branches. He has risen indeed. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was running out of time Sin separated The breach was far too wide But from the fire side of the castle He held me in his sight So you, you made a way Across the great divide Left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside And there 
at the cross He paid the debt I owe Broke my chains, freed my soul For the first time I had hope Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied Thank you, Jesus, it has won Inside my tomb of sin You were buried for three days Then you walked right out again And now death has no sting And life has no end For I have been transformed By the blood of the Lamb Thank you, Jesus, for the Precious blood Thank applied you, today Amen. to our hearts, to our lives, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. For all the earth 
had trembled And the sun had hid its face And all the men that walked with him Had turned and run away Well they crucified the Savior And they laid him in a tomb And the life that once brought love and hope Slipped away that afternoon Satan bleed with pleasure On the day at Calvary For he thought that he had worked A mighty victory And like him, all of the demons of hell began to cheer. <laughs> But little did they know that their end was drawing near. Cause
Father, I want to pray. Lord, you know the people that we've been praying for, and you know the needs that are represented in this house and the ones that are on stream, that if they could be here, they would put up their hand and say, I am going through this, or my relative, or my child, or whatever. God, but you know these things, and you know the ones that are right now battling a disease of one kind or another. You know the cancers that we are believing you, God, that your children become cancer-free by a miracle and that they would continue to be strong, Lord, and that your glory would be revealed, your kingdom purposes would be revealed in all of that. We pray for Anaya who, who, who lost her eye and in that accident and, and her family and her together are believing God, believing you for a miracle, believing you for restoration and, and healing there, Lord. We continue to pray for Emily, uh, the, the friends of, of Jake uh, that uh, other names sometimes take away from me, but, uh, but we know that Emily is in a, a coma, but God, every time I pray for her, my heart jumps because I feel like you're, you're about to say, wake up. You're about to say it's time, but there's purpose. There's purpose in what's going on at the same time. And so with faith, we continue to pray and say, yes, God, wake her up. Hallelujah. And Lord, for the marriages that are struggling right now, God, we do intercede. We pray for healing because so often it's a brokenness that needs to be healed. We pray for your bounds, your, your bonds of love to hold them together as they process these things. We pray for this community, for the churches, the leaders, the Christians, that need to be encouraged and strengthened and know that they're not alone, that you're doing a special work right now. You're saving people and preparing your church for eternity. Lord, and I know there's a thousand other requests that we could say, but as we leave these things at, at your feet, we pray for your miracles, for your hand, for your purposes, for your kingdom glory. In Jesus' name. And now, Lord, for this service, also, we have prayed, but again, just to say, please pour out your spirit on us. Bless this time as we celebrate our Savior's resurrection. May we have a revelation that goes deeper than it ever has before. And may people be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to share with you a message that I called Living Between the Cross and the Resurrection. And I'm going to share a lot of what I really believe today. Like it's, it's hopefully not boring, but it's not, it's like a lot of theology, but I'm just going to hit on some stuff, okay? And so I can't go into it all deep. But when you're talking about the cross and the resurrection, like you're talking about the centerpiece of Christianity, and there's a lot of stuff. So when I'm saying stuff, it's not ideas or, or possibilities, it's what I firmly believe. I'm going to start by reading one of the gospel writers' version of the resurrection from Matthew 28. You can 
since I'm going to be preaching for at least 20 minutes, um, probably, I'm going to get you to stand up as I read this. But I want you to focus, okay? Would you do that? Just really focus on this. Now, after Sabbath, as it began to dawn on the first day of the week, this is Matthew 28, if I didn't say that, Mary of Magdala and the other Mary came to look at the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. I would have loved to have that job. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And those keeping watch were shaken for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he was lying. Go quickly now and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. The song rolling in your head. And behold, he's going before you to the Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. They quickly left the tomb with fear, yet with great joy, and ran to bring the news to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them. Shalom, he said. They drew near, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. Don't be afraid, Jesus said to them. Go tell my brothers to head for the Galilee, and there I will see them. Verse 16. Now when the eleven disciples went to the Galilee, to the mountain Jesus had designated, when they saw him, they worshipped. But some wavered, and Jesus came up to them and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. There's some kind of an ending that some churches say, like the gospel or something like that. And then other people respond. I think that that's honorable. Have a seat. Hallelujah. Mm. In John 13, verse 33, Jesus says, when he's with the disciples at the Last Supper, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I'm telling you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. That must have been a disappointment for some of them. Well, verse 36, Simon Peter says, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replies, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Well, that's what I want to talk about today. Today, we're taking a few moments to reflect on both the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Like I said, the most important story in the Bible. It's important that our theology, our understanding of what it means, be clear for us and what God has done. Let me repeat and highlight this verse. Jesus saying, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. And so let's look at first what this verse is telling us. That the cross is a great divide between two eternal states. You might say two eternal conditions. If you like words, two realities of eternal existence. The cross stands between them. Most would probably say that it stands between life and death which it does in the natural world, and as which many thousands who were near Rome or Jerusalem were experiencing that at that time. It stands between life and death. In fact, with regard to the cross, the cross divides history between B.C. and A.D. B.C., of course, was translated before Christ, and A.D. is Anno Domini, after, or sorry, um, the year of our Lord is what Anno Domini stands for. Even interestingly, the whole idea of cancel culture was alive and well already back in the 90s when 
in order to remove Christ, they developed the CE, Common Era. For me, that's still Christian Era, CE. I like that. I'm okay with that. Yeah. And actually, that was what the original ones who, who coined the phrase BCE and CE, they actually were meaning it to be Christian Era and before Christian Era because it was the 1800s, about 1887, when a group of Jews, before Israel had even been reconstituted or anything, and they, in their writings and stuff, referred to the time from A.D. as being the Christian era. They weren't in favor of it, but they definitely, that's what they called it. They referred to it as that change that took place. The cross separated those two eras. But anyway, from the perspective of the kingdom of God, it's not life and then death that cross separates. But it's the reverse order. It actually stands between death and life. Or you could say between the eternal conditions of lost and saved. As in, are you lost or are you saved? I have some funny stories about that, but not right now. I have a good friend, though, who, uh, maybe one quick one. I have a, a dear friend. She may not be alive anymore. I don't know. Um, her name was Marlene. She was from Jamaica. And uh, I can't speak it right. But anyway, she was one of the dearest saints. And uh, I remember a couple of times when people come up, would come up to her when she was walking either in Toronto where she lived and places like that. And they would say, oh my dear, are you lost? And she would say, oh my, no, I am not lost. I've been saved by Jesus Christ. And it's just so funny because she was, she was just that kind of a wonderful person. Hallelujah. Between lost or saved, the cross stands. Hallelujah. Why? Why is it like that? Well, because, I believe, because what you believe about the cross of Jesus Christ determines what you are. What you believe about the cross of Jesus Christ determines where you are, what you are, who you are. It determines your eternal condition. It's everything. It's very important. Jesus, God's own Son, came. I mentioned this on Good Friday. Jesus, God's own Son, came to be the Lamb of God. Which refers, Lamb of God refers to the role that the Lamb would take as a sacrifice for sin. And literally means the one God would choose to die for the sins of the world. The Lamb of God. God chose this Lamb to die for the sins of the world. And on that cross that separates those two ages, he did, Jesus did just that. He died for the sins of the world. He accepted willingly the punishment of sins for the whole world. The good news is that whoever believes on him is promised eternal life. Not just longer life, not just length of life, as in eternal length of time, but there's more to the promise. And I really want to focus on that promise this morning, friends, because the promise is that there would be eternal life includes being born of the Spirit, which I'll come back to, and being given a new body, one that has all its arms and legs and hair, a glorified body. Some of you got that. A body that cannot die and does not wear out. Hallelujah. When we believe, we do not immediately receive that body, do we? No. We do receive Holy Spirit and a promise of resurrection. Resurrection to that glorified state in the future. The promise of God in the future. Jesus promised it. And that it would take place at something called the first resurrection. The big resurrection. That's when it's going to happen. Hallelujah. That's when we'll have all our stuff. But where are we right now? So we return to our text. Where I am going, you cannot follow now. But you will follow later. And in verse 37, Peter comes back with, Why can't I follow you now? Why, I'm ready to die for you. What's this verse telling us about why Peter couldn't and why we can't follow Jesus right away, all the way, right now? 
Basically, Jesus is heading for resurrection. And he's heading for glory right now at that time. So he says, you will follow me later. That is, you will follow me through death and resurrection, but not right now. Jesus had to go to the cross. These disciples were left with the same promise, interestingly, as we are. I took this from the Amplified, John 19, 14. It says, Jesus speaking, just a little while now, and the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me, because I live, you will live also. And so we have the same promise as the disciples did. Jesus' promise is resurrection. Hallelujah. For the waiting disciples, it was first and foremost, the promise was that Jesus would be resurrected. His promise was resurrection for himself. He told them that. He would do it three days from now. Watch and see. They didn't seem to get it. It's funny for us, isn't it? Reading the New Testament and seeing how he would say it, this is going to happen, and they'd be like, we don't understand. I'm like, it seems like English or whatever language they were hearing it in, but it was kind of hidden or blocked by fear. But then, to those sad, worried, waiting disciples, Sunday morning happened. <laughs> and the stone rolled away. We read about it, and we sang about it. And it revealed an empty tomb. And it revealed a risen Lord. And His resurrection became our resurrection to eternal life. Hallelujah. His resurrection became our resurrection. Praise the Lord. And the resurrection of Jesus is. I want to share with you what it was, what it is, and these are all, I got five main things, and they're all way too big to unpack today, so don't worry, it's not a five-point message. Promise. Five quick points. First of all, the resurrection of Jesus was God's glorious response from heaven to his death. Declaring that the work of the Lamb of God is done, approved, acceptable. Efficacious, if you like words. Hallelujah. God said, I accept it. It's enough. It's done. Hallelujah. Secondly, the resurrection of Jesus was God tearing up the guilty verdict of all who would trust in Jesus. Tearing up the guilty verdict. Guilty of sin. Guilty of breaking the law of God. And he tears it up on the cross. The handwriting of the ordinances that are against us. Amen? The resurrection of Jesus is our access to spiritual rebirth. That's why baptism has such a parallel to it. That's why oftentimes you see where people are being baptized they seem to be born again at that moment when they're coming up out of the water because there's a very clear parallel that's there. And for many people, I think it's a reality. That's when it takes place there. I loved in the movie, The Jesus Revolution or whatever it was called. I think it was what it was, yeah. And, and, and some of the people had a revelation while they were underwater. I know some people have a revelation that I better get out of here or I'm going to drown. But other people have a revelation that I think is very deeply spiritual. I believe in the significance of water baptism. I don't consider it to be entirely saving you, salvific, but it is connected. It is a parallel, and for some, it is the moment. And it is very significant, though, because God draws it in because it doesn't just tie it to, I believe, but it ties it to Jesus' resurrection because God ties the death of Jesus as us going underwater, doesn't he? And he ties the resurrection of Jesus with us coming up out of the water to new life. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, he gives us the parallel and he says that God caused us to be born again through his resurrection. Wow. He's right. Told you I'd tell you stuff I believe. Fourthly, okay, that was one whole point there. I apologize, I went into that. Fourthly, the resurrection of Jesus is our victory. Hallelujah. See, death is defeated for the believer in Christ. I'm excited about this, because I'm going to die. Surprised? I got bad news for you. So are you. But it's our victory, because death is defeated for the believer. Once and for all, no more fear. 
You can't touch me. For me, it's a door. Hallelujah. It's resurrection time. Now the resurrection doesn't happen immediately then, but I won't go into the whole point. Each one of these is too, too much to unpack today. But that idea, it's our victory. The resurrection of Jesus was our absolute done victory. It's mine now. The devil cannot scare you anymore as a believer with what happens to your body. Amen. And fifthly, the resurrection of Jesus is our spiritual authority. Jesus' victory includes all authority in heaven and earth, which he then delegates to the believer. Matthew 28, 18, we read, Jesus had authority, has authority, and he gave it to them. He says, so everything has been given to me. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, so now you go. In that authority, you go and do my work. We've got God's authority to say no to the devil. We've got God's authority to say, he that believes. Hallelujah. And we can walk in it. And I encourage you in that. See, Jesus also promised that he would never leave us. We read that also in Matthew 28. But we, his church, must still walk in faith between the cross and the resurrection, because his resurrection is past, but our resurrection yet is yet ahead. And so we walk between those two, waiting for that resurrection. Not his resurrection, as I said. His disciples at that point were awaiting the resurrection. They weren't sure. I mean, they wanted to believe, but they weren't sure. They were afraid. But what a relief on Sunday morning. So much so that they had a hard time believing it. You know? Have you ever had a real worry, a real concern, and then the news comes that it's, it's all better, it's fixed, or it's okay? It's like, it's like that time, I remember, one of many times that I've had trouble in my life. And this one time I was in jail. Doesn't matter why. And, uh, and, and I was there, and it was cold. <laughs> And it was going along, and the other three people that were jailed with me all got away. And I was the only one, and I was going to be the other one with all the charges. And uh, it really, I could just kind of like hear the devil saying, you're going down for this. By the way, at the time, I was headed for my preparation for ordination as a pastor, which was interrupted somewhat. And... Uh, He's, li he's whispering, he's lying in my ear and just saying, you know, this is going to be bad. Your life's going sideways now. And then when they came and they let me out, there was one relief. But they said, but don't worry, we'll be, you'll be going to court and they're still going to process. I was half relieved just to get out of there. But then a couple of months later, when they found me at a restaurant, I don't know how they did, it was God. I was in Burlington in a rest pizza, in a pizza hut. Could you find me? I mean, if I didn't tell you where I was? So a waitress comes up and says, the payphone on the wall just rang, and it's the police looking for you. <laughs> I didn't know where to go with that. Run? <laughs> anyway, I was with other pastors. They would have... Anyway, I, so I went to the phone, and hello, and they said, hey, just... This is the police. How, how did you find me? I didn't even ask. I didn't care. Uh, and I, he said, uh, we decided to drop all the charges. You don't have to come to court or appear. You're free to go. And I had this, had this overwhelming, it's all fixed feeling, you know? And it was just like freedom. I felt chains falling off of my, spiritually just falling off my wrists. And I, I had been, you know, going through the motions, but really carrying a weight. And it was just like I floated all of a sudden. I was free. The guy on the other end of the phone said, we're not saying that you didn't deserve the charges. I'm <laughs> figuring he's got to cover himself, whatever, you know. He doesn't want me to sue him. I just wanted to be free. Somebody said, you could sue them, you know. I said, I don't want anything to do with them. I'm running as fast as I can back to the north. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's the freedom. That's the freedom. Hallelujah. 
So the disciples were waiting for the resurrection of Jesus. And when they came to the door or met them and said, hey, we just ran into Jesus. And he's alive. And oh yeah, he's waiting for you in the Galilee. Say, oh, well, can we get there today? Because, you know, I want to go there and see him right now. Everything that he promised. And when Jesus' resurrection was understood as a reality, it became their resurrection too. Because our new birth and eternity is in his resurrection. When we believe that, it becomes ours. Hallelujah. Our physical resurrection to our glorified body is part of his final promise to us. And we have not received the fulfillment of that promise. But we hold on to it with the assurance of God inside. And that conviction affects our whole life. It alters our whole life. It motivates our whole life. Hallelujah. This isn't the end. There's more. I'm serious. His resurrection is that good. <laughs> Hallelujah. Faith in the promiser is our victory that overcomes anything this world can throw at us. 1 John 5, 4. This present state is not heaven. It's not the promised land where there's no more sickness or pain or death, though there is some remedy, but I'm not, that's not the purpose of the message today. God has given us remedy in the meantime, but our victory right now is by faith. We hold it by faith. But the Holy Spirit of grace is our constant companion. He fills our heart with hope. And friends, in the meantime, those who belong to Him the crucified and risen one live by faith between the cross and the resurrection. And there's nothing the devil can do to stop that. Hallelujah. And there's nothing that anything can do in your body to stop that. We live by faith. My question to you before I close today is do you have that assurance? Is that in your heart? Does that hold you firmly? Because it is available to you today. If you have not, I'm not talking about religion. I just thank God for every effort that man has made in religion to try to be good and try to approve, be approved by God. But it didn't work. I'm sure somewhere God said, good try, little buddy. Come to the cross. That is available to us today. And so my question for you is, if you have not already, will you receive Jesus? Will you receive His gift? Will you receive His promise? His promise is not a generic or a general promise. His promise is very personal. It's very specific. It's sent out generally, but we receive it personally. I will take that. I thank you Jesus, for going to the cross for me. I give you my life. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, this Resurrection Sunday is a great time for some people to say, I want to dedicate my life to Jesus Christ starting right now. I want to get baptized. I want to stand up here, be a member of a church. I want to be no more afraid of death or anything. I need the peace of Jesus that comes from having experienced life of the cross, at the cross. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you would like to pray with me or one of the pastors or one of the leaders, please don't leave today. We'll only just take a minute of your time and it'll change. From that side of the cross 
death to that side of the cross, life. If you need prayer for something else, I'd be happy to pray for you for that too. God bless you. Have a wonderful Resurrection Sunday. Celebration. Amen. Thank you for coming today. Amen. Amen. God is good. To those who sit in the darkness of death's shadow Gives hope to those who've lost hope Along life's weary road And He gives life to those who feel Their lives just not worth living Takes away your burden When you can't bear the heavy load It all lies in the hands of the Father created everything The answer lies in the hands of the Father The beginning and the end He is a King of Kings Inspiration when you couldn't care less. Light your heart on fire even when it's made of stone. He knows exactly what you're thinking even when your mind's a mess. He's right beside you when you think that you're alone. It all lies in the hands of the Father who created it. The answers lie in the hands of the Father, the beginning and the end. He is a king of kings. Wicked man conceives and schemes and labors with its dark details But God just laughs cause in the end he'll crush them all These evil men so proud seem to think that God is really dead But the mighty now in the end will fall Cause it all lies in the hands of the Father The answer lies in the hands of the Father, the beginning and the end. He is a king of kings.
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I hope you're all having a beautiful morning, and your day will be great because Jesus is your Savior. Amen. Today we're going to read something called, the title is, He Will Carry Us Home. And the verse is Isaiah 46, 4. Even to your old age, I will be the same. And even to your graying years, I will bear you. I have done it, and I will carry you. And I will bear you, and I will deliver you. Amen. The year is very old, and this verse is a promise for our aged friends. Yes, and for all of us, as age creeps over us. If we live long enough, we will all have gray hair. Therefore, me and we as might as well enjoy this promise by the foresight of faith. When we grow old, our God will still be the I Am, abiding forevermore the same. Gray hairs tell of our decay, but he does not decay. We cannot carry a burden and can hardly carry ourselves. The Lord will carry us. Just as in our young days, he carried us like lambs in his arms, so he will carry us in our years of infirmity. He made us, and he will care for us. When we become a burden to our friends and a burden to ourselves, the Lord will not leave us to ourselves. Rather, he will take us up and carry us and provide for us more fully than ever. In many cases, the Lord gives his servants a long and calm evening. They worked hard all day and wore themselves out in their master's service. And so he said to them, Now rest in anticipation of that eternal Sabbath that I've prepared for you. Let us not dread old age. Let us grow old graciously, since the Lord himself is with us in fullness of grace. Wow, I can relate to that. I have some gray hairs. Maybe too many. <laughs> Maybe some of you do, and some of you are just going to start getting there. And the ones coming, or in our group already, haven't had them yet. They're coming. <laughs> but anyway, dear ones, dear ones, the vine and branches, I hope your day is a wonderful day, and I wish you that every time I read to you. So, Lord God, we come before you, Lord, in our ages that we're in, and you've seen the beginning from the end. Father, we just lift up our joy to you that, Lord, no matter how old we are, Father, we can count on you to provide, help us, Lord, and not to worry. It is not for us to worry. Lord, you will, you will provide, you said it, and how thankful we are, Lord God. Lord, that you see how we are as we get older, as you created us, Lord. And that you know every need that we have as we age. And Lord, may we help those that are also aging, Lord. Whether it be parents or neighbors or people we don't even know. Wherever we go, Lord, may we always help another person. Lord, whether they're along in years or whether they're children, Lord. May we always be in your service wherever we go. And may we always shine the Jesus, the Holy Spirit, show us where to go or who might need prayer standing in that grocery line or standing in line of, of any line, actually, and going for a walk and going for a run or, or a bike ride or a car. Pray for those people. Pray for those people. Oh, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you saved us. 
And we thank you, Lord, that we know you have our today in your hand and our forever until the day we meet you in your hand. How grateful we are, mighty God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.